Good morning, everybody, and welcome to um, PSRC and the Department of Commerce's webinar on housing. Um, we'll get started here in just a second as people start to arrive. And we want to, um, uh, I'll, first I'll introduce myself. I'm Paul Ingram. I'm the Director of Growth Management at the Puget Sound Regional Council. Really uh, glad to have you here um, with um, webinars. It usually takes a minute for, for people to arrive, so we'll give that just a second. Um, and we'll introduce all of our speakers here in a few minutes. So um, first, just to get us all started, I uh, hope you're having a great morning. Um, where are you joining us from? So we're going to start with just a couple of polling questions. So I think these will pop up here. And um, let us know, uh, you know, do you work for a city or a county? Um, if you're a consultant or for some other agency, like an MPO, like us. Let's, let's um, get some of the results on this. Okay, and we're starting to see some here. A lot of people from cities, it's great. Um, a few counties and consultants and others, so great. Um, and it looks like we're getting about 49 people so far. We expect a few more than that. Let's do our next question as we're kind of getting warmed up here. Uh, this is the most important question of the day. You have to pass this one. Let's go ahead and do the next poll question. Okay, so how are you feeling about the conference of plan update process? We should, uh, we, maybe we should have had here, uh, like, you're going to get it done early or on time, or you expect it to be late. <laughs> but no, we just, we'll just start with, uh, you're really stoked about it. Uh, you're nervous, you're feeling overwhelmed, maybe a combination. Um, so give yourselves two seconds to think about, you know, how are you feeling about this? And let's go ahead and let's start to look at the results. Um, Let's see, what do they look like? Okay, a good mix, a good mix. Uh, about 20% are saying, yeah, they're feeling awesome. That's great. Um, a good middle group there, almost half saying nervous, but excited to do this. Um, when we've done some past uh, checking in with people, we've seen a good number of planners that have not done a conference of plan updates in the past. So that's great to have a whole new group of people that are getting involved. Um, and uh, and a few of you in that overwhelmed category. So I, I'll say just regarding being overwhelmed, we hope to provide the right balance today of both giving you lots of good information. Um, and so in some ways that might be overwhelming, but we also hope that it gives you a better handle and grasp on, on some of the details of things that need to be updated or ways to be able to do that. Um, so a little bit of a mix. Um, we don't want you to leave this overwhelmed and thinking, wow, there's all this stuff and I have to do all this stuff. Um, but we also want you to know that there are lots of different tools and resources and uh, techniques out there to do it. So I'm just going to do kind of a quick introduction before we turn it over to our speakers. Um, and if I can do this, so this is uh, Passport to 2044, looking ahead that 20 year period. Uh, it's our first session on housing, addressing racially disparate impacts. We'll talk about that a little bit, what that means. Um, we did an initial overview of comprehensive plan updates back in June. Now that's available online if you just want to get kind of grounded. If you didn't uh, participate in that, it kind of gives you an overview of the whole update process. Um, there was one on climate on August 17th. Economic development, transportation have also occurred. Um, and you can see several others that are coming up with dates that are scheduled. Um, we'll have registration information on some of those um, as they come up and get confirmed and the dates get scheduled. So if those are of interest to you, if you're looking at on how to do any of those topics, please sign up for them. Um, I wanna acknowledge this has been joint with the Department of Commerce. You'll hear from Laura Hodgins uh, later uh, 
about their housing work, but they've really been instrumental in all of these. We've also had um, support from the Municipal Research Service Center, and they're a great resource as well. Um, some of these will be led more by uh, Commerce staff or other state staff. Some will be from PS4C staff, and we have some guests as well. Uh, just a few quick logistics. Uh, there's a recording for today's meeting. All the presentations will be shared. Um, if you have a question, um, the chat only works one direction in webinar format, but we, there's the Q&A function. So please go ahead and enter questions into that Q&A format. As we get to certain breaking points in the presentations, we'll stop and pause, uh, look at some of the questions, try to answer some of them. Depending on how many there are, we might not be able to get to all of them, but we'll try to get to some of the some of the big topics. And um, PSRC has also been working on an FAQ of, of sorts. So if you have questions and um, maybe they're not covered by the, the staff that we have here today, maybe we can add them to our FAQ or get back to you in some other way. So please use that Q&A. And then we ask if you would stick around to the end. And at the end, we have a survey that will help us complete our Title VI uh, requirements of finding out who's participating in uh in these webinars so we appreciate that so today um, we have a great program um we have laura hodgins from the washington state department of commerce um and we have uh, laura will talk specifically about the commerce work on um racial disparate impacts and then we have uh, Stephen and Ted from Tacoma talking about some of their work on affordable housing and anti-displacement strategy. Um, so we, we like to see, you know, not just what does the state require, but what are some local jurisdictions doing? How are they implementing it? Um, Stephen and Ted will have a great presentation talking about the work that they've been working on um, that you might be able to borrow some of their ideas. And then um, Laura, Benjamin will um, talk about PSRC's work um, where we've been developing some guidance and uh, resources to address racially disparate impacts. And of course, we'll have time for Q&A. So that's what we plan. Want to just kind of provide some very brief notes about why this, why this webinar. Of course, uh, House Bill 1220 changed the Growth Management Act and it said we need to look at this as part of our housing elements during comprehensive plan updates. We also know that there's been a lot of past actions that have created inequities going back, you know, over 100 years. Uh, we had different uh, laws that prevented ownership by different uh, ethnic minorities um, where they couldn't own land. Um, or the Japanese internment where people were physically removed from their land um, and forced to sell at discounted prices, um, as well as other forms of discrimination over, over time that have created some you know, winners and losers in real estate and in housing, creating uh, different impacts where some people were able to have intergenerational wealth transferred uh, from you know, from one generation to the next, as they were able to pass down the houses and they've been able to create that wealth. Other people have essentially had their uh, wealth taken from them um, or haven't been uh, allowed to participate in that process. So uh, this new requirement in GMA really allows us to dive into that, um, recognizing that maybe some of those past discriminatory practices don't no longer exist. Um, but maybe there are still things that are barriers to rectifying some of that, or that we have language in our policies or our codes uh, that, that prevent people from achieving some of that wealth or property ownership that people have in the past. So this is really an opportunity for all of our jurisdictions to look into that, to find out, do we have policies? Do we have zoning um, that is uh, maybe not directly discriminatory, but that creates barriers to different people? Um, local, this local comprehensive plan update, I would say that when PSRC reviewed housing elements during the last round, we saw lots of great plans, lots of great policy work on addressing housing choice and type and affordability um, and promoting housing work. 
I think this is something where this really kind of goes to that next step. And so this comprehensive plan update is to do more than just kind of looking at housing choice or affordability issues, mm -hmm. but really looking beyond that and thinking about how do um, how do our policies affect um, racial and disparate impacts. So that's what this one is about. If you're here hoping for the commerce's housing needs numbers for your county or your jurisdiction, this is not the webinar for that. Uh, those are still in development. There's been a lot of draft work on developing the housing needs analysis and the tools for uh, allocating that to jurisdictions. Um, Laura, my, Laura Hodgson's at Commerce would be a great person to check in with later about that work if you're not been haven't been tracking that. But if you're thinking about housing needs analysis or other aspects of, of kind of the housing element update, um, those might be better for another time. We do have a second uh, housing webinar that we'll do later, especially after some of those numbers are out. But this uh, session will really focus on displacement and uh, racial and disparate impacts. So with that, I wanna just talk a little bit about these kind of webinars and resources that PSRC, Commerce and others have been developing. Uh, we want you to do great work in updating your comprehensive plans to reflect the needs of your communities um, and of the state of Washington. So we wanna be as helpful as possible with the resources that we have. Um, Vision 2050 was updated in 2020 and um, continued a lot of the regional policy themes that we've had and emphasized some. Housing was one of the key issues uh, for that update, and there was uh, additional work to emphasize the needs for need for housing overall and the need for um, access to affordable housing in Vision 2050, as well as several other uh, uh, policy themes. Uh, it's a great resource if you just want to kind of look at some policy aspects um, from Vision 2050. It's a great resource. We've updated what we call the plan review manual. So it's a document that talks about how to update your conference plan and what we look for when we review plans to ensure consistency with Vision 2050. It includes different checklists. Uh, these are the types of things. Um, that would address the policies in Vision 2050. So that's available online. Um, and there's a webinar that talks about that process. Um, you can see here some examples of the guidance in the plan review manual, the types of checklists, um, and how it kind of walks through topic by topic so that you can make sure that you're covering all the things needed. Because at the end, we want it to be easy for all the plans to become certified. Um, we also have lots of other resources. So in addition to the plan review manual, um, there's some handouts. There's an excerpt of just the, the multi-county planning policies, so you don't have to read all of Vision. There's Vision uh, consolidated down into a nice little booklet, and we have printed copies of that if you'd like a, an actual physical copy. Um, there are, are the webinars are recorded and posted online, and we have a matrix of policies if you want to get it down into that policy analysis. And then we have a bunch of guidance and resource documents. Many of them have been developed and are now posted online, and we have a few that are still in the works. Um, so you can see the list there. So hopefully lots of great resources. Again, we don't want to flood you and overwhelm you, but we also want to have uh, the resources available for you as needed to be able to help you do your update work. And with that, I'm going to end and stop sharing. Uh, Laura Hodgson's is one of the senior planners in the housing group at Commerce, and she's going to uh, join us now to talk about racial disparate impacts and the work that Commerce is, uh, is doing to support that. Uh, welcome, Laura. Thank you for having me. And your Wonderful. slides look perfect, Laura, before you Wonderful. Ask. <laughs> thank you. Uh, and thank you for the great introduction. So one of the biggest changes to the GMA in the last 10 years was House Bill 1220 laws of 2021. This significantly changed the housing element requirements to require much more intentional planning for housing to address the housing crisis and inequities we see in housing across our state. So today we'll focus on the second half of 
the requirements, the racially disparate impacts, displacement, and exclusion. But as Paul mentioned, we do have an upcoming webinar in February on the other portion, which is the projected housing needs work. But before we begin, I just wanted to share a little bit about Commerce. Commerce is not just growth management services, although that's how you normally interact with us. We do touch every aspect of communities. So we also touch all these areas listed here, including our brand new housing division um, that's recently been expanded with all of the federal funding. So House Bill 1220, as we mentioned, includes other portions. So I just wanted to provide a quick overview of that before we dive into the racially disparate impacts portion. But first, the goal for the housing element was significantly changed. So instead of encourage affordable housing, communities are now to plan for and accommodate housing affordable to all economic segments. So in the realm of both planning for our housing needs in terms of numbers and addressing equity in our community, this puts more focus on actions local governments must take with regard to housing in their communities. Commerce has, is working on projecting those housing need numbers at a countywide level. We have those draft numbers out now for your review on our website as well. And we're currently working through guidance for the some of the policy pieces related to those numbers of how do you make sure you have the, enough land capacity for those income housing need buckets that are coming out uh, in January. The final numbers are coming out in January. And how do you plan for those moderate density housing types and housing in relation to employment centers that really make sure that you are getting at the housing types that will then be affordable to, to residents in your community. So we're working on the, that guidance that in the second section here that will be coming out in draft form in December and January. So keep your eyes out. Hence why we'll be doing the webinar on this material in February with PSRC. But today we're gonna to be focusing on the second half of 1220, which talks about the racial disparate impacts, displacement and exclusion requirements. So under this section, uh, each fully planning community must now identify local policies and regulations that result in racially disparate impacts, displacement and exclusion in housing and begin to undo those impacts and identify areas at higher risk of displacement and establish anti-displacement policies. We realize this is a mouthful and a lot of work. so. We are working with, uh, we've worked with an advisory group to come up with guidance that we think will walk you through the steps for doing this work and are providing numerous examples in our guidance as well as a training webinar. So I'd like to walk you through the steps for completing that we think a community should take to complete this work um, based on our, our review with our advisory work group. What the guidance says in brief and um, uh, also, a brief glimpse of the parts of the work and what that may look like if you were to do it yourself so that you can get a little preview of a test run of that work. I did a test run last week of some of this. So, but before we begin, I wanted to kind of make sure we were all on the same page with definitions. These terms were not in the statute, were not defined by the legislature. So we work with our advisory work group to define them. And I think uh, many of you in the PSRC region are very familiar with displacement, so I'd like to focus on two of the terms, and displacement and displacement risk. So I'd like to focus on two of the terms that are kind of new to the realm of planning, and you'll hear a lot in this presentation. And those are racially disparate impacts. We have defined this with our advisory work group, subject to your comments and feedback, that it is uh, when policies, pra practices, rules, or other systems result in a disproportionate impact on one or more racial groups. So it's a focus on race and disparate impacts. And then exclusion in housing is the act or effect of shedding or keeping certain populations out of housing within a specified area in a manner that may be intentional or unintentional, but which nevertheless leads to non-inclusive impacts. So exclusion then is not necessarily based on race, it can be based on other factors. So with that context in mind, I did want to tell you a little bit about the process for how we arrived at these steps that we're going to be going through. First, we created an advisory work group that was composed of planning staff around the state, um, from small cities to large cities, from counties, uh, large counties to small counties, and uh, a diverse group of planners. We worked with them to define the terms that you saw on the previous slide, as well as the others in statute, and review 
the data pieces that a community might look at to determine the impacts in their community and the methodology, these steps that we're going to be walking through, as well as the draft policies that a community would then look at implementing based on the findings from their data. We also interviewed equity experts to get their input on this material on this process and then compiled draft recommendations that were then published in September and we held an open house on that on September 22nd that recording is available on our website. After a public comment period which closed last week we're now finalizing the guidance into a final document and we'll do a webinar um, that date is now December 6th so that um, not that November, but December 6th. So that's where we are in the process. And what does it look like then to go through this work? So I'm gonna do a brief overview on this slide and then walk through each of these steps in more detail um, and then walk through what it means to do this work because as, as, as you all know, this is new and not necessarily easy, but we wanna show you that it is doable and it is, um, it is, uh, will have good impacts in your community. So the first step is to understand your community, identify the goals of your, of your community and measures you will use to examine if there are these impacts in your community. Are there disparate, racially disparate impacts, exclusion and displacement? And at this time, it's also important to identify those populations who are at risk of those impacts in your community so you can engage with them through this process. The next step is to identify the measures and examine the data that will determine if you have these impacts in your community and identify the areas of higher risk of displacement. For example, are there disproportionate housing impacts for one or more racial groups, i.e. are there racially disparate impacts, or are there exclusive communities that are, are not accessible to all residents, i.e. is there exclusion? From there, you'll be able to evaluate your policies. What policies and regulations have contributed to these impacts and to the housing situation on the ground? Or do your policies have unintended impacts that result from the current policies? So from there, once you review your policies and know which either are missing or need revisions, you can then revise your policies, identify those that need to be strengthened um, and, and strengthen those with revising of certain words or adding in new policies. Then the final step, which I think uh, really gets to making sure that the policies have impact in our communities and are making the changes that we need to see to provide a more equitable housing environment is reviewing your regulations and revising your regulations and programs to implement those policies that you've developed in the previous steps. So what does this look like as you walk through the process in a little bit more detail? The first step involves understanding your community's desires and future housing outcomes. Next, based on these housing outcomes, a community will identify how they want to determine if there are disparate impacts or if there are just uh, different housing outcomes in their community between one community and another, either location-based or race-based. We have a list of data measures in our guidance and information on how to select the measures that are most appropriate for your community. And we'll be adding a little bit more um, clarity to those in our updated guidance. Then, as I mentioned before, identify the populations that are most likely to experience these impacts. The assessment should provide observations on who shares in the benefits and who bears in the burdens of the desired housing outcomes. Are there some people who have disproportionate housing impacts because of race or been subject to displacement or exclusion? because of rising prices or other or infrastructure investments coming in that are forcing them out. And from there, you review those measures and populations with your community organizations to make sure that what you're seeing in the data, does it really match what's happening on the ground in your community? Are those areas at risk of displacement actually areas at risk of displacement or is the data perhaps misleading? And usually it'll probably be directing you in the right place, but we wanna make sure that what we're seeing and and using as a basis for our next steps is really what your community on the ground is experiencing. The next step is to review uh, this data and evaluate it. Um, so evaluate those measures identified in step one by race to determine if there are racially disparate impacts and review the data that may be indicators of displacement. 
For example, have there been demolitions or foreclosures or a concentration of evictions? Then review, are there areas of over or under representation of groups in your community? In other words, is there exclusion? As well as identify areas at risk of displacement. Where does residential zoning contribute to these disparate impacts or exclusion? After looking at the data, consider checking back with your community and engaging community members can improve your understanding of the data and more importantly, the unique barriers faced by these marginalized communities. Now remember as you do this work that zoning restrictions tend to make it harder and more expensive to own a home and it's more likely that people of color have been disproportionately affected. In some communities, this effect was intended and in other cities, the tight restrictions were not intended to be discriminatory, but still contributed to disparate impacts or exclusion. From there, after one has analyzed the data to see if there are disparate impacts or displacement uh, or exclusion, the next step is to do a policy evaluation. The guidance provides one framework for evaluating policies as shown on this slide, but any evaluation should really look at each housing element policy and how it has contributed or tangentially supported the impacts that you have identified in your community or the, the uh, impacts that you see on a, a sub-regional basis. In this evaluation framework, we recommend looking at each policy to see if it supports or challenges the overall growth management housing goal and whether or not it addresses or improves uh, the disparate impact, displacement, and exclusion that you may find in your community in step two. And again, while a lot of this is based on the, the data, you'll see um, in later slides how, how this works and how um, it really sheds a light on how to evaluate your policies moving forward. From there, you have a basis for making the changes to your policies. Do existing policies need to be strengthened to prevent future negative impacts or exclusion? Or do policies need to be rewritten because they've contributed to impacts or exclusion or could contribute in the future um, based on how they're written? Are new policies needed to address impacts or prevent future displacement? And how will a community ensure that there are improvements over time? Are there monitoring or assessment policies in place? I think that last piece is really important as we think of and work to make sure that our communities are more equitable over time. Putting the policies in place is important, but making sure that we are regularly checking back with them will ensure progress and more equitable um, access to housing in our communities. Then the final step should be to review regulations to make sure they're consistent with the policies. Are changes needed in regulations to align them with the new or strengthened policies, or are regulations needed to implement the policies that you already had on the books in the first place? We have a lot of recommendations for how to take your policies and put them into action with regulations, and we hope that you will take a look at those, that last section in the document as you do your housing element review, because code updates are, are required with a comprehensive plan, but as I mentioned before, they're really how we make sure the policies in our communities get implemented. The role of commerce in this guidance is to interpret the statute and provide recommendations, as well as to provide support. So in addition to the guidance document that's coming out, I will also be on staff to provide support to communities as they do this work. And we're hoping to see work through this process to see what other resources communities need to do this work and provide them along the way. But in terms of interpreting the statute and, and taking those first steps to, to do the work, we believe at Commerce that the statute says that communities should do the data analysis and, re and record that analysis. It's not specifically required, but it is the framework for doing all of the next required steps, which are to identify the areas at risk of displacement, analyze the housing policies and regulations, identify and implement those policies and regulations that address racially disparate impact, displacement and exclusion, and establish anti-displacement policies. And as I mentioned, our guidance goes through a variety of examples and is going to walk communities through how to do this work. And I'm walk, going to walk through a little bit more of that in a minute here. But first, before we do, what do we think communities may find as they do this work? We think communities will find that they um, lack sufficient policies to address racially disparate impacts and exclusion, particularly. Um, in the PSRC region, you, I think you're ahead in, in how you have looked at displacement in the past. Um, and I think a lot of communities will find policies on their books to address that. 
But I think these other two areas are where we're going to need, communities are going to need to potentially strengthen or add new policies. Communities um, will also need to, will also find that their regulatory changes will be needed to implement these policies. And we think that those can be um, implemented in a variety of different ways. We think that there's a kind of four or five different buckets that um, not only policies um, to address racially disparate impacts, exclusion and displacement fall under, but also the regulations that will then um, make sure those policies get put into action. And as you see here, they're grouped in the buckets of increased affordable housing production, because by increasing affordable housing production, you create a more diverse mix of housing types in the broad areas of the city, thereby eliminating exclusion or reducing exclusion and those racially disparate impacts. Um, policies and regulations to preserve existing safe and affordable housing are vital to preventing future displacement. Um, helping existing communities to stay where they are um, allows them to thrive and um, prevents displacement as well. So our policies and regulate regulatory uh, recommendations to implement these changes are grouped in these buckets in our guidance. But I think also where communities are, it's important for communities to focus is to look where at the equity and displacement impacts outside of the housing element. It's not strictly required, but to fully address racially disparate impacts, exclusion and displacement, a community really needs to look outside of the housing element at the infrastructure and other public investment decisions that are critical to equitable impacts to all residents. So looking at the transportation element, looking at the capital facilities element and looking at the land use element. So as you use, go through the work on your housing element, think about how you can use this framework to review your other sections and help them build off of each other to create more equitable communities in where you live and where you work. So now I'm gonna switch gears a little bit and dive into what I think um, a data analysis and a policy analysis would look like in a community. Um, Enum Claw was generous enough to let us use them as an example. So we're using them as a example to show how looking at this data in your community would 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 go down how how long does it take you to do this and um how you might go through the work yourselves um just a quick note this is not as overwhelming as it may seem i was very overwhelmed by potentially having to do this work and i sat down uh last week and worked through it and it took me less than a day to pull the data um and make some findings that i think would then lead to improved policies now in, in the case of Enum Clyde didn't go through and pull their policies and try to tweak them themselves. But from a data perspective, we wanted to see what it might look like for a city of around 12,000, um, which is a small, smaller city. Um, Medium-sized cities might have more capacity and be able to see findings more easily, but it's a little harder at a smaller scale. So we wanted to choose something here. So going through this work, we recommend per the statute to look at four different things, racially disparate impacts, exclusion, displacement, and displacement risk. So I'm gonna go through each of those quickly, provide a quick overview, but happy to answer more questions later on. So to look at racially disparate impacts, as I mentioned, a community will need to identify what are those ways that we are evaluating if we have those impacts in our community. Um, we have five different direct measures in our guidance for ways that a community might look at those impacts and additional indirect impacts. For, uh, I think the simplest and most direct way to look at this in your community is to look at housing tenure by race or ethnicity. You can do this by pulling ACS table 2502 and you get the information on the right after you hide a few columns. So what would this show in Enumclaw if you were to be pulling this and, and doing the analysis yourself? Um, based on the margin of error, we're not seeing, um, we're not able to deduce a lot of information um, based on um, some of the, the racial categories here, but we are able to see based on ethnicity that um, there are disparate impacts for Hispanic or Latino. There's a disproportionate impact in the amount of Hispanic or Latino people who own homes versus who rent. More of them rent than own based on the general breakdown of the population. So that's one finding that you could easily make based on just this simple data pool. 
Um, some of the other data pools include um, looking at cost burden status by race or ethnicity and CHAS data. It requires you to compare a few different tables and pull data from one table to another, but it enables, enables you to find those findings rather quickly. Um, also, homeownership by race and ethnicity is another, as well as um, uh, housing costs compared to household income. We do recommend that you be uh, cautious with using a uh, rate of overcrowding um, due to um, other considerations that may come into play. Uh, for exclusion, there are also a list of I, measures that you would look at when you're looking at exclusion in your community. Over or under representation of a subgroup that shows that one group may be excluded from an area versus another. Concentration or dispersion of affordable housing, segregation by neighborhood, and ratio of jobs to workers. This map here for Enumclaw shows estimated medium value of homeowner occupied housing. Data is also available for homeowners who are cost burdened. Um, but this may uh, indicate what types of housing is available to whom in your community and where certain communities are excluded based on income. In this map, uh, we have turned on the layers indicating estimated renters who are cost burden. Uh, and one of the, I should step back here and say that I think one of the tools that I think communities will find that is very helpful in looking at exclusion is policy map. And while it you can get more data with a paid subscription. I was able to get all of this data with uh, an unpaid subscription. So there are resources available for planners to quickly pull this information and do the work because we know we have you have a lot on your plates. So as I mentioned in this map, I've turned the layers indicating estimated renters who are cost burdened. Um, this would support communities' findings on exclusion. But I think there's also a variety of different things that communities can glean from these maps that they should then evaluate with their communities. Because as I mentioned, the data will tell one story, but we wanna make sure that these, this data is ground truth with their community. Is this really what communities are experiencing so that we can then develop policies and regulations accordingly? So I think what I would glean from this map is that there are actually um, areas that are at risk of this higher risk of displacement in the South Central area based on the rates of cost burdening. So this gives me a finer tuned information to then do community engagement to determine, is there a risk of displacement in those communities? Um, this goes a little bit more detail than the PSRC anti-displacement risk map and helps communities to then take the next steps. For displacement, there are a variety of different measures. Most of these measures will be at the local data level, uh, either the county or city data. You won't find a lot of these in the, the census data or CHAS data, but um, they are a, you are able to find them with searches or looking through community records. On a quick search, I was able to find that uh, foreclosure data, that's the top right image here. Um, that shows where people may have been displaced due to raising rents or property values. Um, I was also able to pull, pull, pull eviction information. Again, you'll want to take this information and think about how it works in the context of your community and evaluate it with community-based organizations to understand what those impacts are to then inform your policies. But the data pull itself is not as overwhelming as it may seem. Then for areas at risk of displacement, um, thankfully in the PSRC region, you do have the anti-displacement risk map, which is a great starting point. You can then use the policy map tools that I mentioned before to do an even deeper dive in your community or do your own analysis based on uh, guidance in our document. But one thing to also look at, I think, as you look at anti-displacement risk is look at the location of existing affordable housing in your community. These are areas where um, they are more at risk of, how, of displacement and ones where you will be able to quickly pull some information to make some findings of where you need to be careful about uh, potentially upzoning or infrastructure investments that you don't address, don't um, perpetuate displacement in your communities or, or lead to more displacement. So on the left here is a map that quickly shows the location of manufactured home communities. We all know that uh, a lot of us know as planners that those are continuing members of those communities are being priced out as they're bought by investment firms. 
So it's what would be one area that you could look at as well as looking at affordable housing properties in your community and when their affordable housing incumbents may be running up. So in the interest of time, I'm gonna switch quickly to housing policies and then wrap up here so that, that Tacoma can present. But we did want to show you that in our guidance, we do have a variety of example policies that communities can use as a starting point to think about new policies that may be needed, particularly with relation to exclusion or racially disparate impacts or ways to improve policies. So here are a few, I'm not gonna spend a whole lot of time on them, but I would like to point out the, the first one here on the list, which uh, is promote a diversity of housing unit types in all residential neighborhoods to meet the needs of all existing and future residents. A more general policy like this uh, that aligns with the housing element goals will uh, go, I think, a long way in setting the groundwork for your policies uh, and your, your regulations moving forward. But what would it look like to do improve an existing policy? Um, this is a little harder, uh, perhaps, and, but one thing I think most communities are going to um, find a lot of value in doing. So I took this policy of maintain the character of established single family neighborhoods through adoption and enforcement of appropriate regulations and thought about how I might make that better. Well, first um, character, although it is a uh, neighborhood character is used uh, in the GMA, can also be used as a way to um, prevent future um, housing opportunities in our communities. And we know that the wider variety of housing opportunities we have in our communities, the more people can access them and the less disparate impacts and exclusion we will see in our communities. So changing that word from character to scale and form, which I think is really the intent of what we want to preserve in our communities, will help to make sure that we can add more diversity to our existing housing neighborhoods while still preserving what most people see as the, the main things that keep the community, make the community feel the same. Um, we also change single family neighborhoods here to residential neighborhoods. Um, single family neighborhoods should not be the only ones where um, they have uh, the key character or um, items that they want to preserve in their community retained. Um, we should be looking at that in all communities. And also we removed enforcement because that could result in displacement risks and instead focused on solutions that were tailored to meet the needs of the community, i.e. context sensitive regulations, which could allow supports to allow residents to stay in their homes as much as possible and prevent displacement. This is one example. You can revise policies in many different ways, but we do encourage you to look at your policies with the lens like this um, in a way that will um, for uh, that will begin to undo those racially disparate impacts, exclusion and displacement. Uh, so we have heard a lot of input, input from stakeholders over the past month and are working to synthesize it and determine how we can address it in our final guidance. We'll be working with our advisory work group to make sure we're getting that planner lens of what did, how do we incorporate what we heard in a useful way in our guidance? Um, so we're working through that right now. And I want to thank all of you who are on the call who provided feedback. We appreciate that. Um, some of the feedback we received is listed here. I'm not going to go through all of it, but we did hear loud and clearly that it would be important to add information on the effects of past discriminatory practices and how they influence land use to date and why we are where we are as a society. Some of that background information that Paul provided at the beginning. And we'll be adding material on that that communities can then use in their staff reports and in communications with their council as they begin to have these hard conversations with their community. So our next steps are to incorporate the feedback that we've heard, finalize the guidance. We plan to do that hopefully by the end of November. And then we'll have a webinar on December 6th on the completed guidance, walking communities through this work and uh, allowing a little time at the end for questions and answers. And we'll be recording that so communities can then use that over the coming years as they do their housing element updates. Also a quick reminder that we do still have assistance available for the uh, communities who want to do the racially disparate impacts work with our middle housing grants for the PSRC jurisdictions. And if you're interested in that, please contact Mary Reinbold. 
Um, but we would love to work with you on that. And we have staff available. We've actually hired three staff to work with communities who are doing these grants over the next year to provide technical assistance to do this work in their communities, because we recognize that it's not necessarily the easiest thing to do. And with that, I'd now like to introduce Stephen Sawada, uh, the Innovations Manager, and Ted Richardson, the Affordable Housing Action Strategy Coordinator from the City of Tacoma. They'll be sharing about their affordable housing work and the current state of anti-displacement in Tacoma. Thank you, Laura. Uh, so give me a second and I'll share my screen. I'll go to the first slide. Okay, so we are with the City of Tacoma. My name is Ted Richardson and I work on our affordable housing policies. And for a little bit of history, back in 2018, Tacoma passed what we call our Affordable Housing Action Strategy. We call it AHAS because we do love acronyms. Um, there are four overarching objectives within the AHAS and each of them has specific actions underneath. And this is all different ways that we can create affordable housing or maintain affordable housing in Tacoma. Or uh, like the fourth one says, reducing barriers for people who encounter them because we know that some people in Tacoma are more at risk in terms of housing and being able to stay in housing. So specifically with anti-displacement, in the last year, we've shifted our focus a little bit to, to hone our focus in on displacement because we've seen it as a growing need in Tacoma. So the first thing that happened to really focus is that our council passed resolution 40781 last November, and that's affirming the use of data-informed tools to do this sort of work and specifically focusing on what we call low and very low opportunities of the city. And I'll show you a map that shows where those areas are in a minute as well as the community members that we know are most at risk, specifically our BIPOC members, and in particular, our Black and African-American Tacomans. And in addition, this resolution affirms support for community members doing the same work. So uh, Laura, I did steal these from Commerce, but we found them to be very useful. So these are the three types of displacement that we see, physical, economic, and cultural. We're really focused on the first two just because we are considering housing solutions and the cultural displacement is more of people who aren't forced out of their housing, but they may no longer feel welcome in their homes. And the policy solutions to those sort of issues are more around business retention or institution retention. So jumping into the data that we've have so far, we have a pretty good sense of where the highest risk of displacement in Tacoma is. The map on the left is the housing precarity study out of the University of Berkeley. And you can see the red parts are the areas in Tacoma where the highest, where there's the highest housing precarity. And that's a combination of several, diff several different statistics of displacement. In the middle is the eviction studies map, and it shows where eviction filings are the highest. And then on the right is our own equity index, and it's a it combines about 30 metrics of what we call opportunity. And so those are anything from education attainment to tree coverage. And the red parts of the equity index are the what we call high opportunity areas or very high opportunity areas. And then the white are the very low opportunity areas. So across these three maps, you can see that the areas of Tacoma most at risk are fairly aligned. And this is important just because if we do implement policies that are geographically targeted, we would know where to implement them. Continuing with data, we have a pretty good sense as well on race and who is most at risk for displacement. Uh, both per a report done in 2018 and another, the homeowner disparity study done in 2021. And unsurprisingly, it did show that our BIPOC members, and in particular, our Black and African American Tacomans, are less likely to own their homes, more likely to experience homelessness, 
and more likely to be at risk of disease. And the homeowner disparity study, it was required by HUD per their fair housing laws for us to begin doing more specific uh, work that is geared towards specific demographics. We're also beginning to look at economic data, uh, in particular rent increases over time in Tacoma by zip code. And then we're getting some information about rent increases that are of such significant amounts that someone would be displaced. And that's coming from the housing authority, the tenants unions, and our partners in the community. And Laura, you spoke to this some. We're, I list these reasons that I also got from commerce about specific, specific types of displacement. And we really want to be able to use these to estimate the magnitude of these different reasons for why someone might be displaced. We haven't yet been able to dig into this work. Um, and then a dream of ours is to really take our current program data and then extrapolate that using demographics to estimate the risk across the city. So an example of that, of that would be, we have a home repair program for low-income home, homeowners. So if we could take the demographics of that program and then estimate how many total households across Tacoma might need that program, then we could see how important it would be to expand that program. But we haven't been able to do that yet. And with that, I'll pass it to Steve. Thanks a lot, Ted. And um, yeah, so I'll give you folks a little bit of an overview of some of our existing programs that relate to the action areas that we're focused on around anti-displacement. And they also map you know, with what you might be familiar with as the three Ps when we talk about anti-displacement, production, preservation, and protection. And I'll talk a little bit more about that as well as I go through this. So this slide here in particular highlights some of our rental and utility assistance programs, um, inclusive of our tenant relocation programs. So since 2021, you know, we've been able to assist um, over a thousand households with close to $8 million of emergency rental assistance. Um, uh, we launched that program in 2020 with, its, with um, a goal of at least 45% of households served by uh, or headed by a person of color. And to date, we've been able to exceed that goal uh, with 65% of the households served as um, headed by a person of color. And we were able to achieve that through working with our partners um, who serve the populations we, we know we needed to reach out to. Um, we continue to do our work with utility assistance as well um, and have uh, provided over $12 million of assistance distributed across various programs like our uh, our BCAP program, and those continue to uh, exist as well through the utilities. Um, and finally, we're um, continuing to try to bolster our tenant relocation program. So far, we've provided um, over $18,000 since 2019 to help 18 households relocate. We have a few more in the pipeline. And like I said, we continue to try to bolster that as well, knowing the pressure um, that tenants are facing uh, around relocation and rising rents. Next slide, please. Thank you. Thank you. Action area two, expanding tenant protections, really touches on that third P uh, around protection. So policies that we've implemented thus far, well, you know, we, we enacted the rental housing code in um, 2019, and that was um, something that we didn't have as a part of the Tacoma Municipal Code. But since then, um, last year, we've implemented just cause eviction. So we took what the state had implemented and um, added it to the municipal code, the rental housing code, so that we could provide um, enforcement to tenants who were experiencing um, issues related to just cause eviction and were not being evicted um, according to those just causes. We have a couple of additional policies that we're currently working on and bringing through city council now, inclusive of notices for rental increases. So we're trying to look at different tiers of rental increases based on some of the historical data that Ted had mentioned around the increases that we've been seeing over the last couple of years to make sure that um, if, if and when those things happen again, tenants are provided with the right level of notification to, um, uh, to manage the changes uh, ahead and challenges ahead um, for their housing. We also have policies that we're looking at and exploring around standards for shared housing, knowing that as tenants are put into more precarious situations around 
um, their ability to afford housing, that they may be sharing housing with other people. And we wanna make sure that only authorized spaces are rented um, and that eviction standards are followed as well to ensure that all tenants in, in that um, um, home are notified if there are um, evictions uh, taking place. We're also looking to um, ensure that we can uh, confirm that a landlord has a city of Tacoma business license for uh, being a landlord when trying to evict a tenant. Uh, so we're working um, to explore what that would look like in partnership with um, the court system and um, reviewing that with council as well. And finally here, late fee standards. So we're really looking to see um, what kinds of standards we can put in place around late fees, knowing that they're an increasing burden um, to tenants and, and that the ranges that they uh, might experience now fluctuate quite dramatically. So we're looking at other jurisdictions to see what some of the policies are that they've enacted as well. Thank you, Ted. I'll turn it back over to you. Okay, so our third action area with anti-displacement work is an increased focus on home ownership. So we have two programs currently in place, foreclosure prevention assistance and down payment assistance. And we're considering a few other policies. We'd really like to see a community land trust stood up in Tacoma. The city does uh, have a stance that it doesn't want to lead on that, but rather support it. It does want it to come from the community. And then two policies we're actively looking at are community prioritization and right to return policies. And this would, this would advantage community members who could show that they currently lived in an area of Tacoma that was at high risk of displacement or had previously lived there. And so that new housing would target those members who had that historic uh, past in that neighborhood. So it would be actively uh, actively mitigating that displacement risk. And then right to return could also um, target down payment assistance towards those community members. This action is uh, similar to what Laura spoke to earlier. We're currently in the process of upzoning all of Tacoma. We went through phase one last year to set the map for where single family areas would go to what we call low scale which is really duplexes, triplexes, and quadplexes. And then about 17% of the city will be upzoned to what we call mid-scale, which is small apartment buildings. And it's not saying that single family homes can't exist, but it allows for these new types of buildings to go into these areas. And with that, we can also add in or increase our use of a few affordability tools. So we could, we might expand our inclusionary zoning areas of Tacoma. We might offer uh, height incentives or density incentives to developers or lower our parking requirements. And then we've also been fairly successful using the MFT program and that will expand to more parts of Tacoma through this up zone. And then along with this, we're also looking at how we can use ADUs and DADUs to increase affordability in Tacoma. There are some ways that the city can lower the cost of building an ADU, specifically through pre-approved plans or extra uh, permitting desk help. And we're looking at implementing those two things right now, but we have struggled a little bit to think through how we can really use ADUs and DADUs as an active anti-displacement tool, just because we know it is still very expensive for a homeowner to build one and then the rent they'd have to charge is still somewhat significant. Or can we support low-income home, homeowners in building one? But again, it would be very expensive for us to uh, give significant financial support to low-income homeowners. So we're thinking about that uh, and working through those questions right now. Steve? Thanks, Ted. So action area five really touches around that preservation component of anti-displacement work. So trying to preserve the existing affordable housing that we currently have. Um, so a couple uh, programs that we really wanna highlight, well, one in particular is a single family rehab program, which consists of rehabilitations that city helps to oversee. So we've completed 
48 projects from January 20th through the 22nd of September. And we have um, nearly 30 on the wait list um, as, of, as of September. Um, additionally, in addition to that, we have partners that we work with, such as Rebuild, Rebuilding Together South Sound um, that we funded, and they have completed 149 um, small repair projects through 2017 and 2022. Um, again, this is what uh, we, we know this is critical for preserving the homes and the affordability that people currently um, are able to take advantage of. And we, uh, while, while this is a this can be an expensive program, knowing the cost of materials and, and, and other uh, work that continues to escalate with inflation. Um, we still um, hope to you know, continue to uh, bolster this program and support the efforts of it as well. We are looking at um, better monitoring on subsidized and unsubsidized affordable housing within the city. So that's a component of the affordable housing action strategy that uh, Ted had alluded to earlier. But it's something that we've had a, a slightly more challenging time um, wrapping our intelligence around, right? So capturing that information. I think the subsidized projects that we know exist are easier to kind of capture um, through data from uh, the projects that we funded, through data of our partners. And in addition to that, the MFTE um, projects that have been completed as well. I think. The challenge is with the unsubsidized affordable housing. So what we might hear be referred to as naturally occurring affordable housing or um, affordable housing uh, or market rate affordable housing um, to determine when those units as well might be seeing changes in either ownership or increase or dramatically increasing rents. And so we're trying to establish um, better tracking through uh, our, our um, tax and license uh, program that issues those licenses. And so we have a business case to enhance some of our, uh, our data capture there that is going to continue to, to work its way through um, city governance. And we'll hopefully know more at the beginning of 2023 on that. Next slide, please. So in addition to those areas, we have, um, well, in addition to those programs that we currently have around preservation, we're looking at some additional policies for consideration as well what a preservation ordinance might look like to be able to um, uh, require notifications of plans to opt out of uh, different contracts or affordability restrictions, uh, if people are refinancing or selling their property to ensure that we can um, have some opportunity to preserve what's there. We also have uh, in the works, we're looking at a right of first refusal policy, um, which would enable um, entities to purchase properties. So if there are other affordable um, housing providers um, or owners out there that could purchase um, affordable units that are uh, in the process of potentially coming off the market, we wanna be able to offer that um, to them at market rate. In addition to that, we're looking at tenants opportunities to, re to purchase um, uh, properties. And so specifically allowing tenant groups who already might be living in multifamily properties to collectively purchase if that property is put up for sale. And finally, a housing preservation fund. So we're, we're trying to examine what a, a dedicated source of funding would look like uh, for the city or its partners to use to acquire properties or offer low interest financing to keep rents stable, uh, or to make property improvements in addition to um, attaching affordability covenants to those properties um, as they're preserved. So these are the some questions I put up for the group, but these are the questions that we're still in the process of answering and what our types of displacement are, uh, what data sources we're using. So thank you for some of that information, Laura. Um, how to estimate those types of displacement. Of course, there are additional policies out there um, and uh, what issues we might see with some of the uh, policies that we already have implemented. So things to think about, things that we're still working through. And if anyone has thoughts on this, we'd love to connect in the future. With that, I'll pass it over to Liz. Great, thank you so much. Um, we've got a lot of great questions in the Q&A. So I'm gonna just pose a couple now, um, and then we will probably come back to them during the longer Q&A session in a minute. Um, but uh, I think question for Laura, um, is census data that shows a community to be, to be more homogenous white 
uh, than surrounding areas enough to, to demonstrate that there is exclusion. Yes. I want to talk about that in our guidance because some communities were oh, intentionally or unintentionally defined that way, um, but they are exclusive in the context of the subregion. So, yes. Great. Um, I think maybe this is a question for um, all of our folks so far. Um, pushback on racial equity discussions often relate uh, to the disparate impacts being related more to income than race, and that race is a byproduct of those inequities. Uh, do you have any suggestions for ways to respond to those types of questions, particularly around remedying past harms uh, that likely caused this connection? So um, curious for Tacoma folks or from Laura, any, any comments you might have about um, the connection on race and income there? Uh, I guess I could share a story. I mean, I can't think of an amazing zinger of a response that would instantly convince somebody of this. But recently we had an article published in the Tacoma News Tribune, our main newspaper, by uh, Maureen Fife, the CEO of our Habitat, as well as Tuana Nobles, the senator from a uh, part of South Pierce County, talking about just this and housing disparity based on race. So it's just an example of really finding the champions in your city. And I'll, myself and the city will take no credit for that article or their awesome work, um, but really finding the people in the city that um, can support you in that messaging. I think I would just add to that. I think that as we think about this, you know, these hard conversations that um, we've all kind of gotten to where we are as a collective society. Um, so doing what we can to, um, uh, you know, have those conversations that, you know, if we weren't, you know, a part of the problem, we were sometimes the, the societies or the organizations or the, the governments were complicit. So um, we all should try to work towards a solution where it makes it better for everybody. So um, regardless of where where the finger pointing is, we all know where we want to get to in the future. Great. Thank you, Laura and Ted. And if I could add, Liz, um, rely on the data. You know, the data don't lie and do your best to get to that level of granularity to show um, to show racial demographics and the disparate impacts and the, the relation between that and the housing situation that we're in. I, I, I think that the compelling evidence that out, that's out there that, that Ted has suggested between um, just some of the tools that we use, like the housing precarity risk model, um, different displacement indices, and the, um, the equity um, tool that we have at the city really just kind of creates those ties, right? And the story that we tell connects those ties. And so that's, I think the power of storytelling and the power of data is something that uh, we shouldn't take for granted in this. In fact, we should leverage for this conversation. Great. Um, so I think, oh, Ted, do you want to have another another word? Sure, take up more space and time. But uh, so we had our council pass uh, resolution 40622, and it affirms the city using, looking through a racial lens at any policies we implement. And then that policy I re or the resolution I referenced in the presentation 40871, um, affirming support for this work being done through a racial lens. It really gives us as staff something to lean on. So if your councilors are amenable to passing a resolution similar to that, I think it is a really good tool. Great. And I know that this question we asked, we will send out links to presentations and other resources. So we could definitely send out a link to that afterwards. Um, I think in the interest of time, I'm going to um, introduce uh, PSRC's Laura. Um, and so Laura Benjamin is the principal planner with our growth management team, and she's going to talk more about um, some of the regional resources and guidance that we can provide. Thank you, Liz, and good morning, everyone. Give me just a moment to start, start sharing my screen. All right, hopefully folks can see that. So as Liz mentioned, my name is Laura Benjamin, and I'm going to be talking through some regional guidance and resources to address racially disparate impacts in local comprehensive plans. Just a quick update. So we'll talk about the regional framework and the policies and strategies um, that are at the regional level that'll help inform local work. Um, talk about some regional data, similar to some of the examples Laura shared, examples can be at the local level, as well as some regional analysis that can be used for context and comparison with local analysis. 
And then we'll walk through a variety of resources and guidance we have here at PSRC. And I know it's been said before, but I feel like I need to keep banging this drum just to make it clear that we are going to have a second workshop in early 2023. More information is coming soon on um, need. So um, we understand that's an important topic and we'll be talking more about that soon. So for the regional framework, really looking at the policies and strategies at the regional level that are um, helping to drive this work forward. First is are the housing policies in Vision 2050. As Paul mentioned, Vision 2050 is our region's long range plan for growth um, that was adopt adopted and updated out to the year 2050 um, in 2020. So when we started the update process with our growth management policy board, we heard from board members that they wanted a laser focus on housing that was really an important issue um, as we updated the plan and, and those multi-county planning policies. So the policies are really centered around these three themes. First, that housing is a regional issue. Um, housing access and affordability issues are in every community. They may look different and they may need different solutions, but everyone has a role to play. It's not just a big city problem anymore. It's not just a Seattle problem anymore, but all communities need to be doing more to address housing access and affordability. Next is that we need to not look at housing in a vacuum. Um, housing is not just the, the units, but it's people and building communities. So we need to think about housing and how it's tied to transportation choices, jobs and services, the environment, and all over quality of life. And then third is that jobs housing balance is key. So not only do we need to be thinking about housing growth, but we need to be thinking about jobs growth and the connection between where people live and where they work and do they have opportunities to live and work in the same community. So as part of Vision 2050, um, the plan directed PSRC to develop a regional housing needs assessment and a regional housing strategy. Um, PSRC has been involved in housing work for some time, but this was the first time that we as a region developed a regional needs assessment and a regional housing strategy. It um, serves as a framework to increase coordination and collaboration to address housing access and affordability. So really it's trying to um, promote best practices, things we're seeing that are working in local jurisdictions, and then it's also trying to um, improve coordination and collaboration to get jurisdictions and other stakeholders to work together on some of those stickier issues that a single jurisdiction couldn't tackle alone. So the strategy is based around these three S's, supply, stability, and subsidy. So supply is really looking at the units so that we need more housing units of different types. Stability is really looking at um, anti-displacement and providing opportunities for people to stay in communities, so providing housing that meets their needs. And then third subsidy is really about the funding and the financing. So making sure that we can create and sustain long-term funding sources and really focusing that on um, creating and preserving housing for very low income residents and unhoused residents. So, you know, folks who the private market just isn't going to provide housing for. One other thing to note, so Paul mentioned that we have a plan review manual, really, really helpful resource for local planners. Um, it includes a housing checklist for local comprehensive plans. There's a screenshot of it here. And so we are going to be working on the addressing inequities and access to housing portion of the checklist today. So then moving on to regional data, as I mentioned, we'll be sharing some regional data analysis we've done. Um, some of this type of analysis can also be done for a local jurisdiction. And some of the regional analysis could also be used you know, for some context setting or um, comparison to see how a, how a local jur a jurisdiction looks compared to um, the region. So first off, looking at median income, we see there are disparities when we look at um, income by race and ethnicity. Here we see a Black household will earn about one third less than the regional median income. And this chart shows median income for each county and the region as a whole. Um, broken out by race and ethnicity. We also know that income um, is tied to wealth, home ownership, to intergenerational wealth as well, but there's lots of other components of it. But this income kind of helps us to start that conversation. We can also look at cost burden by race and ethnicity. So just as a quick reminder, a household is considered cost burden if they spend more than 30% of their income on housing costs. That could be rent, a mortgage payment, utilities, parking. Um, and they're severely cost burdened if they pay more than 50% of their income on housing costs. Also important to note is that cost burden is a relative measure. So when we think about cost burden, we're often thinking about folks who are more in those moderate to lower income levels. Um, if they're spending the majority of their income on housing, that means, you know, there's less of that pie, less of their income for other daily expenses. They're often considered housing insecure. Could be um, one emergency, one, ex one unexpected um, bill away from being unable to pay the rent. And we also with um, cost burden office 
off and focus on renters as we see them as being a bit more housing insecure, especially at those lower to um, moderate income levels. So here we see that Black and American Indian households are more likely to spend the majority of the, their income on housing costs. So again, seeing some disproportionate impacts in terms of who is paying more on housing. One thing we did, and this is actually relatively new for PSRC, um, we did this analysis just this year, is we looked at access to affordable um, housing tied to median renter income and race ethnicity. So as we saw on that earlier slide, there's some pretty significant disparities um, in median income by race ethnicity. So when we look at access to affordable housing for the region as a whole, just by median income, it can gloss over some of those dis uh, disparities by race and ethnicity. So here we see on the map, this is showing access to affordable renters for white households. You see kind of the mint color is unaffordable and the teal is affordable. So we see in some of the, you know, the, the central places, particularly in King County, a lot of areas are unaffordable, but still a decent swath of that teal color for affordability. We then compare that to black households and we see that the majority of the map is now that is that mint unaffordable color. We can also look at it for Latinx households. Here you can see again, more um, of a lack of access to affordability. And finally for Asian households, um, we see a bit more access to affordable housing, but one thing to note is we still see when we dive into the data disparities um, among Asian households and that some of this um, glosses over many of our, the lower income Asian households in the region. We can also look at access to home ownership. This is looking at loan denial rates by race and ethnicity and controlling for income. So we can see people of color are less likely to get a home loan, even when we can control for income. You can see here that the overall denial rate in the region is about 10%. And we can see that most BIPOC um, applicants are over that 10% and white is just slightly under at 9%. Um, one thing to key up some, some um, additional slides is really being explicit that different types of housing cost different amounts of money. I don't want to say they're affordable, but perhaps less costly is the, is the better way to put it. So this um, chart is showing median sale price by home price or by home type. So we see at the top at um, just shy of $900,000 is single family in that teal. And one of the, the uh, less costly options are kind of condo or co-op options and that purple. So we see that low rise condos or townhomes often cost two thirds to half the cost of a detached single family home. So when we think about the type of housing in our community, the types of neighborhoods and the types of housing that are you know, explicitly not allowed to be built and then um, the types of homes that can provide some market rate um, entryways for first time home buyers, something to consider. So then this is also tied to how we can look at home ownership rates by income and race ethnicity. So we see that even when we control for income that there are disparities in home ownership between white and um, BIPOC households, um, especially at those lower and moderate income rates, um, incomes. You can see the, the white alone is that teal bar and especially um, in that 75,000 and under for income, we see um, significantly higher rates of home ownership. One thing to note is that we did kind of some back of the envelope um, quick math, but we estimate over 100,000 more BIPOC homeowners are needed to achieve parity with white homeowners in the region. A few more data slides. Um, so we know access to housing is just one component of why people live where they live, whether it's a choice or something that's kind of forced upon them. Um, so this is showing the percentage of residents by race, ethnicity who live in either lower or very low areas of opportunity. This is part of our opportunity mapping work that we'll talk about in just a moment. And we continue to see that more BIPOC households live in these low and very low um, opportunity areas. So these are areas that have less access to transit, less access to jobs, um, probably you know less access to um, services, to educational opportunities, things like that. So we need to be thinking not only um, about access to housing, but where this housing in these communities are located. We can also look um, at our displacement risk mapping, which again, we'll talk about more in just a moment when we get to resources and data, but we see that black households are four times more likely to live in communities with higher displacement risk than white households. So here you can see that kind of peachy light orange is moderate risk, and then we have the orange is the higher risk, and we can see significantly more black households than white. 
So now getting into resources and guidance, um, some of these resources are housing specific and some of them are um, more equity related but have a housing component. So for some of those resources, we'll kind of just briefly talk about them today um, and they'll be um, explained in more detail at our upcoming webinar um, focused on equity next month. So first up is PSRC has a housing element guide. Um, we actually have one on our website right now that was developed for the 2015-2016 um, periodic update. We are in the process now of updating the guide um, to incorporate Vision 2050 and the regional housing strategies to update um, you know, regional housing data and resources that we just walked through um, and really providing guidance on how to meet the um, plan review manual checklist. So we anticipate that this will be available in um, November, so next month, and really encourage folks to sign up for the um, plan review newsletter, which is a great way to stay apprised to when these um, resources become available. Also, this is kind of a more general equity related um, topic, but we have an equitable engagement guide. It kind of walks through four considerations. There's a link to that right now. Um, I will say when we were developing the regional housing strategy in 2020 and 2021, we held focus groups where we specifically reached out to people who um, were currently or previously had been housing unstable or um, unhoused and really wanted to hear from them about their lived experience and what they see as priorities um, and potential um, solutions moving forward. And we found that really, really helpful that, um, you know, oftentimes when we hold a public hearing or something like that, we hear from more affluent homeowners and when it comes to housing, making sure that we're hearing from people, you know, both owners and renters, different income levels, different stages of life is really, really crucial. So for the opportunity mapping, this ties to that slide I was showing um, about different um, race and um, ethnic households living in different areas of opportunity. So this assesses the amount of opportunity that exists in neighborhood today. Um, into five quintiles, um, and it can uh, really help to show, um, you know, we're different, where we can have growth and kind of the different um, potential impacts um, tied to opportunity. There's a link on the slide. It includes um, our very user-friendly story map, as well as more technical information for folks who really want to dive into the data. We also have displacement risk mapping, which again was tied to one of the earlier data slides. This identifies areas at greater risk of displacement based on current neighborhood conditions. Um, and it, it can really highlight um, period, uh, places where um, policy interventions and public support are needed to mitigate displacement. Um, again, there's a link there and similar to the opportunity mapping, a very user-friendly story map we actually just updated recently um, to tie in COVID-19 and some of those um, early effects we're seeing of the pandemic on housing and displacement as well as the more detailed data um, if folks really wanted to dive into that. We also looked at racial residential segregation. Um, we developed what is called a dissimilarity index, which helps us to understand the degree of ra uh, racial, re racial residential segregation in the region. Um, so you can see there, we, we use decennial census to look at it. So we have it for 2000, 2010, and 2020. Um, and that is also available online. It can kind of help to con uh, contextualize some of your local work. We also have the HIP or the Housing Innovations Program. It is a collection of 49 planning resources to promote housing affordability and smart growth. Um, there are also some of these higher level objectives. One that I think really applies to the work we're talking about today is increasing neighborhood stability by mitigating residential displacement. So it's a nice about five page guide, kind of explains displacement, things to look for, potential policy solutions, priority areas, things like that. Those are all available on our website. There's a really nice um, interactive search feature where you can look at you know, different objectives or things you wanna look through for the different tools, um, as well as we've tried to make the PDF very user-friendly. So it's something you, know, you could print out and hand to a council member or share with staff as well. Um, this is a more equity related um, topic, but does have a housing component. So you'll we'll hear more about this next month, but um, equity planning resources for comprehensive plans. Um, so these are resources looking at the policies by chapter, um, includes backgrounds, highlights external resources and some example language can be, which can be really helpful as well as relevant data. So this is the anticipate will be available by the end of 2022. So again, you'll hear more about this at a future workshop. But one thing I just really wanted to highlight is there is there will be forthcoming resources on housing, specifically residential displacement. So more to come on that. Another more 
equity focused tool that could be applied to um, updating the housing element is the racial equity impact assessment. So this is really a tool for local jurisdictions to examine um, the racial equity impact of policies and actions in, in a comprehensive plan, or it can be applied more broadly to local planning efforts. Um, and it's really a way to explicitly incorporate equity in, in the decision making process. Um, it's really kind of a how to guide with a series of questions to walk uh, the user through. We anticipate it'll be available early next year. And again, you'll hear more about that next month. And then finally, and I think there may actually have been a question in the chat that um, hopefully this will address. Um, one final resource PSRC is developing is what we call the Legacy of Structural Racism Interactive Report. So this is going to be an interactive website to identify root uh, causes of racial disparities. Um, we tried to be really comprehensive in this, going back to colonization and um, you know, all the way through uh, the World War II era and now to con contemporary history and policies. Um, this is in the works. We anticipate it will be available in early 2023, but can be really helpful to kind of provide some historical context of what has happened in the region. And with that, that wraps up my um, the presentation. That's my contact information, and I will hand it back to Liz. Great. Thanks, Laura. Um, we've got a few uh, questions in the chat. Um, please feel free to, if you, as you have them, um, incorporate a few more. Um, but I will start walking us through some of these. Um, so a question for uh, Commerce, Laura. Uh, to Laura's presentation, could you confirm that the exclusion in housing criteria would include preventing and rectifying economic exclusion in areas that may only be attainable to higher income levels? That's our interpretation of the statute. They did not mention race or any specific category. They just said exclusion. So we take that to mean exclusion in any way, shape, or form. Um, but we do recommend you you consult with your community to discuss what how the, the lens they want you to look at it through. Um, but I would say economic exclusion is an important one because that is going to tie very much into what we're seeing in the projected housing needs work, which you'll hear more about in February. That um, a significant amount of our residents are cost burdened and are having trouble finding homes. Um, if you account for cost burdening and renters, moving cost burdening and renters statewide, 50% of our housing needs in the next 20 years are going to be under 50% AMI. So if we don't account for exclusion from an income perspective, economic perspective, we're going to be worse off than we are today. And we're in pretty bad straits based on the data. So and what you see, you know, in terms of people being able to afford and, you know, paying too much for their, their housing or being having to move further out or having to move states even. Um, so, yes. Great. Um, while you're here, another Laura question, Laura H. question, um, what ex equity experts were consulted in, I think, the process to develop the guidance? Um, is there more explanation on the Commerce website? We do have some information in our um, a public uh, participation plan for the racial disparate impacts work. We do have a one, like a two pager on that. Um, I would have to double check uh, who all we consulted, but I know we consulted, for example, PSRC. Uh, we conducted consulted some, I think, some university experts in, uh, who work on equity. Um, I, but I'm happy to provide you a list of who we um, interviewed um, on that. If you reach out to me at my email. Great. Um, this is a, a, another Laura directed question, but I think I think we've kind of touched on this through other presentations. But um, can you provide some examples of basic policies and regulations that address displacement? So I think Tacoma staff kind of walked through some of the examples that they've encountered. Um, any other sort of resources that you would point uh, jurisdiction to? We have a whole section on that in our guidance on uh, policies that would address displacement. Um, so I would definitely check there, but. Rental protections, um, you know, being alerted of price increases, um, understanding when um, properties do come on the market that are affordable and having first right of refusal. Um, those are, you know, I think all things that Tacoma mentioned, um, but we do have a suite of recommendations in our guidance. And if there's anything that's missing, let me know. We'll make sure to add it. I'm actually going to be taking a look at Ted and Stephen's presentation to make sure we have everything that they're looking at right now in there because it was great. So Ted and Stephen, if you want to email me your presentation. Great. And Liz, just to add on that, I think I just wanted to underscore something both Ted and Stephen said is really 
the data analysis and talking to people is so, so important before we get to that, what policies should we use? Um, I know when we, for the regional housing strategy, held focus groups, I can, you know, I as a planner went in with some preconceived notions about what displacement looked like and what I was anticipating we would hear from folks. And it's not what we heard from folks. Um, so it was really, really eye-opening and I think really crucial to talk to people and get data, both, you know, quantitative as well as lived experience, and then using that to help inform and drive policy decision-making. And you can use that information from, you know, that policy map or other places to connect with community-based organizations on the ground. Also connect with your elderly who are on fixed incomes. Those are a lot of people who are at risk of displacement. Um, so the combination of those two are great ways to connect with those. And if you, um, uh, do you have trouble finding community-based organizations in your, your neighborhood? Commerce does have a list of apparently 38,000 community-based organizations across the state that we can help pull. Uh, I don't think we're able to share it yet. We're looking at being able to share it, but we can also um, identify some in your community if there are some in our database that you can connect with. Great. Um, I think this is a question for anyone um, who uh, has a thought about this. Um, cultural displacement sounds like the result of gentrification, which also causes physical and economic displacement. Can this concept of cultural displacement truly be separated from other forms of displacement? So, any, any thoughts about the role of cultural displacement here? I suppose I brought that up so I can try and answer that question. Um, I mean, the quick answer is no. Uh, we're specifically focused on the physical and economic displacement because in part, we already have some programs in place around business retention, working with minority businesses and uh, institution retention. But we do know we need to do better at that. We're looking at uh, expanding our language access and how different communities can engage with the city. And so all that is really related to cultural displacement. Just the policies that we're looking at over the next year are more related to economic and fiscal. But absolutely, there's it's not like they're two separate issues entirely. I wanted to also add that um, we have a couple neighborhood planning pilots in the works too, in McKinley and Proctor. And I think that that also, that component um, of neighborhood planning can help with that cultural displacement as well. I think there, um, there's, it's a continuum, um, but we're also trying to address some of the most urgent needs around housing at the same time. And so I think that that's where some of the, the bulk of our focus within the Affordable Housing Action Strategy um, is connected to, but we also have efforts underway to address that cultural component as well. Great. Um, I think maybe just a follow-up question to uh, what Laura just stated. So could Laura B give examples of what was surprising about to hear about displacement? Um, just curious. Yeah, I think the big thing was that a lot of the folks we talked to generally had the sentiment that they thought folks who were being displaced from long-term um, either rentals or home ownership, they, they felt like that was like a luxury, um, that we were talking to a lot of folks who were moving every year, every six months, um, or couch surfing, things like that. So. Um, you know, when we think about housing stability um, and we think about displacement, you know, I was going in with kind of the idea of like the grandma who's on a fixed income, has lived in, you know, owns her home and has lived there for 30 years. She's going to, you know, can't pay her property taxes and is going to have to move. That is an issue. That is something we need to address. But it is a very, very small part of the pie. And that is why it's so important to be talking to people and to diving into the data. I know at PSRC, we're really making an emphasis on lived experience and talking to people is data. Um, so that um, I think that was a, a really big takeaway for us. Great. Um, so while the Tacoma folks are up, um, uh, where are the affordable housing policies of Tacoma proposed the municipal code, especially rental and utilities assistance? I'll take a I'll take an attempt at that question. That's a, that's a tough one because I actually I don't know enough about the code to know what um, grants the authority or the power of um, to the housing division to run their programs. I can say that there are parts of the code that um, touch on it, right? Such as um, I believe it's uh, Title VI and Title Thirteen that both address different aspects of what the housing division does. 
Um, but a lot of their, their work and their programmatic work is governed by their consolidated plan that they update every five years in addition to their uh, biannual action plans. So um, Housing Division website has a lot of that information um, accessible for review. Great. Um, another question here, I think probably for anyone, I bet we for commerce uh, more so, um, many of the past harms that have caused disparate impacts relate to federal, state, or general widespread practices. Is commerce uh, compiling any of those impacts that would be relevant for all Washington state communities or counties to help uh, the requirement to record these past harms? Uh, it seems like it would be helpful for um, to help with community conversations. Yes, we're working on that. We heard that that was um, a concern that we didn't provide some of that information, which is the, the basis for why a lot of us are doing this work. Um, so we are compiling that information. We're trying to figure out what level to provide it at because uh, we don't want to overwhelm, but we also want to provide enough detail. So we're working through that. We're going to work through our advisory work group to see, get their input. Um, if you have specific um thoughts, uh, please feel free to email me. We can uh, use those to shape how we uh, include that in the guidance. Great. Um, there are a few questions in here about data. So um, see who, uh, if folks um, out here are able to answer whether we need to um, uh, follow up a few of these later, but a question of how does one get information on foreclosures or other indicators of disparate impacts? So foreclosures specifically are uh, typically in the county recordings. Um, they're also on a notice of trustee sales. I'm not sure how to find that, uh, but we're gonna try and provide a little more information on that. But I was able to find it in the county recordings when I was looking it up. Um, when I found it, it was those at risk of foreclosure who had lands placed it, or tax arrears placed against their homes. Um, so uh, it may not be foreclosures per se, but it, is a sign that there could be displacement uh, or will be in the future. Great. Um, what's the smallest census geographic area that will provide race ethnicity data? So I am not a data expert. Um, I, I've never been evidenced by my data poll that I did earlier, but we do have a staff in our research services group who's actually working on this right this minute, right, right, right now. He's going to pull look at the data sources and data measures that you can look at for all of these different factors that, that we're now talking about and see what level, what size jurisdiction you can get the information for. And we'll, we're hoping to provide a little bit like a, an extra column in our data to say, you know, this data is useful for jurisdictions over 10,000 only, um, for example, so that communities can know uh, upfront where to go for that data. But we're currently doing a a matrix to kind of uh, identify what sources are available to which size jurisdictions. That's great. Um, I'll just put a plug into uh, PSRC has community profiles for each jurisdiction on our website that um, will provide a, like basic information about race and ethnicity in your jurisdiction. I think the question is also kind of where that intersects with some of these other measures, which I'm not a data person and I probably couldn't explain that too well. But um, our community profiles are pretty helpful for just sort of some of the basic information about um, uh, demographics in your community. So we can share the link when we send out the follow-up email for this. Um, let's see. Uh, so maybe on question about opportunity mapping, this is another, another data question. Um, Laura, uh, could you say more about how low opportunity areas are, are identified and what uh, do we mean by some of the education measures looked at? Yeah, so I guess I'll preface by saying I'm more of the messenger and less of the data wonk, but um, how the process to get to the opportunity mapping is wonky. Um, it started with the Growing Transit Communities work, working with the Kerwin Institute out of the Ohio State University. Um, it uses Z scores, um, and then it creates these five quintiles from a very low to high opportunity. Um, I'd really recommend going to the website. It has a really nice kind of two-page handout that um, explains the different kind of factors that go into opportunity as well um, as to the data sources and how that all was kind of rolled up to get to this analysis would be my so I'd say go to the website and feel free to follow up with you um, if you have more information. Great. Um, a question about um, the definitions and providing the definitions from the um, uh, from the work. I, we will send out the, the presentation afterwards. Laura, do you have anything you want to mention about that? 
they are all listed at in our draft uh, racially disparate impacts guidance, which is in our on our website. So um, in there, you'll find all of the definitions for all of the terms that we thought needed to be defined that were um, including gentrification, which can't remember if it's specifically mentioned in the statute, but is tangentially related to displacement, uh, particularly cultural displacement that we, or at least as alluded to in some of these comments. Great. Um, maybe on the cultural displacement front, a uh, question of what's the difference between cultural displacement and the natural changes of culture in a community? Do you have any thoughts about that? I would say cultural displacement is, is one where they don't make the active choice to or it's not natural evolution. It's something that's caused to them, not something by them, like that that forces an action that they wouldn't otherwise take as an evolution of their culture. Um, it's pretty complex, so I'm not gonna venture into any more, but that would be my initial thoughts and I'm seeing some head nods, so. Um, question here about how the Asian population is defined, um, I think, I guess maybe I'll take a crack that I, I believe it's just sort of part of the census uh, terminology and people self identify. Um, one, one resource I will point out as we have a, a PSRC blog post that sort of goes into a little bit more detail about um, the different experiences of um, uh, Asians in this country because, you know, based on um, kind of country of origin. So um, that's something we can definitely share because there's obviously a, a, it's a large group of folks to um, unpack our different experiences. Um, Okay, uh, could you speak to the data sources that will be used for the legacy of structural racism report? Uh, any particular sources that you recommend cities can look at? Um, any that you found personally insightful so far? Yeah, so once again, yes, I am the, the, the messenger on this. Liz, I don't know, I think you have actually been more actively involved in the project if you wanna take a crack at that. Yes, I, I read the question and it was I, something I can think about. Um, yeah, I would say it's a, a primarily kind of a sort of historical look. And so um, there are a number of um, kind of resources available um, kind of around the region. Um, I think History Link is a really is a good one that sort of talks about some of the um, background in this particular region. Uh, we definitely have, there are some really great sites through uh, the University of Washington, for example, that looks at um, restrictive racial covenants, for example. Um, so there are, are kind of a variety of historical resources um, that I think we we found helpful. And we're still, so we're, we're working on compiling that and we anticipate kind of an early 2023 uh, 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 release. It covers a lot of different grounds. So it's hard to just sort of boil it down to one particular uh, resource, but uh, we hope it will be useful. Um, okay, another question. Um, the equity index shows the port as being a high opportunity zone. Is that accurate considering there's no housing located there? Um, is that, does that mean that the data is slightly skewed? I would say no, it's not skewed. So the opportunity mapping can be used for more than just housing. Um, I think it's really important to think about, you know, it factors in um, access to a lot of different kind of components of life and what we consider kind of being factors of quality of life. Um, it's also at the census tract level and there are I want to say just shy of 800 census tracts in the region. Um, so that's one of many, many. So, um, you know, sometimes there are a few that look a little wonky, but um, overall, I think we uh, feel pretty good about the uh, methodology. Great. Um, okay, a question about um, mapping. Uh, can the internal jurisdictional variations, disparities in opportunity and displacement risk and dis the dissimilarity index be provided so that problematic disparities can be more targeted by the equity actions and strategies in the comprehensive plan of larger jurisdictions? Uh, if so, uh, to what jurisdictional scale do you think this could be provided at? So for opportunity mapping and displacement risk mapping, that data is provided at the census tract level. So there are ways to look at that at a jurisdictional level. Um, one, I totally understand that census tract boundaries and jurisdictional boundaries don't align perfectly, um, but we think that it's at a geography that's small enough that local jurisdictions can take some of that data and work with it. The dissimilarity index is a little different and that it uses um, the census data and my understanding is that we really looked at it more at a regional level. Um, we can follow up with a link to our racial residential segregation um, web page that has more resources and a data readme as well um, and happy to follow up with any more questions. 
Sweet. Um, and then there's a comment that came to the Q&A about the community data profile. We recently relaunched it with a new link. Uh, so we will send out the fresh link uh, to everyone uh, so that you can all access that. Um, great. And so it looks like we're kind of nearing the end of the questions. Um, so I will just maybe cover our last slide and our last poll question here. Um, let me see if I can pull that up. Okay, great. Um, so we've really appreciated everyone's participation today. We really want to thank all of our panelists for um, for sharing their uh, their knowledge with us, um, and certainly would welcome additional questions um, or feedback about the session um, at uh, plan review at psrc.org. Um, as I think we've, we've mentioned a few times today, uh, we do plan to have another session uh, in February that talks more about other aspects of the housing element that um, you're probably very interested in as well. Um, so look for information about that, about the date and the registration coming soon. Um, we want to thank everyone. And I think maybe Michaela, we've got one final poll question that we can launch here. Um, asking how we're feeling. Uh, we asked earlier about how pe people are feeling, but sort of at the end of the workshop, I'm just we're just curious to understand kind of where you're at. Uh, we also welcome any other feedback that you may have about the session. Um, as you saw earlier, we have a lot of these sessions coming up, so we really welcome uh, feedback to make sure that they are as useful as as they can be for for everyone participating. Uh, we will send out a follow up email that will include uh, links to the presentation, links to the recording, um, and also um, other things that came up in the session that, that you might find useful. Uh, we do post these on our YouTube channel. So uh, if you have folks who uh, were not able to attend today or you want to follow up later, um, you don't have to have registered. It will just be available on our website. Um, so I think once we're kind of at the end here with our um, question, um, we are going to close this out. Uh, there will be a Title VI poll that launches. It is, of course, optional, but we did. We would appreciate your participation as part of that. So um, thank you to everyone. Um, let us know if you have any other questions, and uh, I hope you have a great day.